Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor emphasizes that North Korea needs to understand the potential ramifications. Regarding Putin and Russia, Moscow has consistently demonstrated its capability to heighten conflicts and tensions, not only with us, but with any nation. McGregor interprets Putin's recent visit to North Korea as a direct and unmistakable message. He suggests that while Ukraine remains a focal point of hostility towards Russia, exacerbated by what he perceives as CIA involvement in Kiev's government, Russia has means to retaliate, such as inciting turmoil in North Korea, a tactic already employed. Essentially, when he deployed ships and a submarine that surfaced off Cuba's coast and moved into its harbor, it was another provocative move. He believes he can escalate horizontally if necessary. He may also initiate talks with Mexican cartels to discuss additional armaments and capabilities Russia could provide in Mexico. This is all part of the same strategy to sober us up and make us realize that benefits him can also benefit us. We shouldn't underestimate his ability to spread influence in ways contrary to our interests. He sees the conflict in Ukraine is essentially over with him holding all the cards and the power to decide the next steps. Our desires or threats don't matter anymore. He's now focused on ending the war and establishing stable conditions in western Ukraine, although we won't support it. He is seriously contemplating seizing Kiev, advancing to Odessa via the Dnieper River, negotiating with new governments in Europe afterward. He understands that European governments are changing, and while not all will immediately align with Moscow, Berlin seems poised to move in that direction, which is crucial. Recent polling data from Poland indicates that the public is weary of the war and the influx of Ukrainians, pushing their government, previously aligned with the EU and NATO, to reconsider its stance. This shift was evident in the recent European elections, where parties advocating against war with Russia and the sanctions imposed on it gained ground. How rapidly can they move? History teaches us that conflict and crisis cannot be switched on and off like a light switch. However, the current trend clearly favors Moscow. Why would they pursue this course? It serves as a distraction, diverting resources in Turkey away from potential actions against Israel. This notion, though, underestimates Turkey's stature as a major power with vast manpower reserves and a strong willingness to confront challenges from Israel and the U.S. Turkish cinema, for instance, has depicted scenarios where American forces are repelled by Turkish troops in northern Iraq, resonating strongly with Turkish audiences. Our global alliances are eroding and former strategic partners no longer see eye to eye with us. Instead, they view us as instigators of conflict and crisis, causing deterioration wherever we intervene. Their objective appears to be relocating populations north of the Ladani River, much like their strategy towards Gaza Arabs being directed towards Egypt or the desert or facing death. A similar approach is contemplated against Hezbollah, aiming to drive Arabs north or eliminate them. However, I doubt this scenario will unfold. Uncontested others will inevitably intervene, leading to wider conflict escalation. The prospect of nuclear weapons being deployed would mark a critical turning point, potentially leading to irreversible consequences. The Turks have long understood they could procure nuclear warheads from Pakistan with whom they maintain a long-standing amicable relationship. Now, that means you end up with a nuclear-armed Turkey. There's no reason why the Iranians couldn't currently build a nuclear warhead and mount it on one of their missiles. They've chosen not to thus far, citing a fatwa that deems it sinful. But faced with the prospect of Armageddon, should the Israeli strike first, the calculus may shift. Entering Lebanon would likely be seen as a strategic boon by Mr. Nidiahu, as he might anticipate drawing support from us. However, here, the critical question remains, where do we stand? How vulnerable are we? We've debated for years about our missile and rocket reserves and our industrial capacity to rapidly scale up production to overwhelm an adversary. The answers are unclear. Our missile and rocket systems often require considerable time to manufacture, and logistical questions loom large. Where will we reload? Whose ports will we use? How will we be received? Our ability to deploy forces such with the Eisenhower in Jeddah depends on the support we can count on in such a conflict. The Saudi stance seems uncertain, and support from others in the South against Israel appears unlikely. Other relations with Italy and Greece also come into play, especially with Cyprus potentially drawing Greece into the conflict. However, our military readiness in the region is uncertain. Modern warfare demands capabilities we often lack, 
robust industrial and scientific infrastructure, and an understanding that all our actions are scrutinized in a world where space-based surveillance eliminates strategic surprises. This capability isn't unique to us adversaries like Russia, Iran, and China possess similar abilities and a willingness to share real-time intelligence. The Ukrainians have benefited from our intelligence support, but Russian adaptation in this environment has outpaced our own. Moreover, there's the looming threat of satellite disruption, a scenario that poses risks for all parties involved. If satellites are targeted, everyone's communications could be compromised. Are we prepared to operate without them? These are crucial questions that demand serious consideration as geopolitical tensions continue to evolve. Lenin, many years ago, referred to it as the correlation of forces. It involved assessing a country's capacity in food production, spare parts, military strength and other factors. They would also consider the country's manpower and its proximity to Russia to evaluate potential threats. They would then analyze their own capabilities and position to determine their own correlation of forces weighing military to social, political, diplomatic, industrial, economic, scientific, and technological factors against potential adversaries. Putin has often pointed out that despite NATO's formidable capabilities on paper, the alliance faces significant challenges. NATO lacks a unified military command structure with member nations retaining national authority over their forces. Moreover, NATO has not fully leveraged its scientific, technological, industrial, and manpower potential. Therefore, when assessing the correlation of forces, Russia finds itself in a more favorable position compared to NATO in the West. In the Middle East, the question shifts to Israel's correlation of forces against its regional counterparts. The balance doesn't appear favorable for Israel when compared broadly. The critical issue then becomes how much external support can be mobilized. It's a known fact that the United States Army is grappling with serious internal challenges. It can't achieve anything. The Russians have clearly demonstrated their ability to escalate horizontally, igniting conflicts elsewhere to divert our attention, resources, and capabilities. The crucial question now is about our national will and determination to act. What are we truly committed to doing? Congress may pass resolutions driven by financial interests, whether from energy sectors or lobbying groups, but true strategic resolve is lacking. There's a willingness to support actions that benefit certain interests, be it oil, gas, coal, or Israeli policies, until the reality of unfavorable correlation of forces sets in. Many still we think as if it's 1991, but those days are long gone. We've squandered our advantages and failed to modernize. Why are we still relying on tanks, Patriot missiles, and radars designed decades ago? Why haven't we invested in modernizing our defense capabilities? The lack of strategic downsizing and reorganization has kept us from making necessary advancements. Instead, we perpetuated outdated systems and equipment that no longer meet current strategic needs. This mismatch underscores the importance of reassessing our correlation of forces. What previous presidents might have done is intervene and caution Prime Minister Netanyahu that he's going too far, especially in Gaza. They would have urged for a different approach, seeking regional dialogue and solutions. However, Israelis typically resist becoming just another nation in the region, preferring supremacy. Past presidents have reigned in such actions. The complaints about equipment shortages or munitions seem partly intentional and partly due to limitations in resources. Europeans are already grappling with similar issues, particularly in eastern Ukraine. There's more complexity here than he seems to acknowledge, and his demands may serve as a warning to lobbyists on Capitol Hill to increase pressure for support. Whether this approach will succeed remains questionable as people are starting to question its wisdom. We urgently need to address and resolve these issues. Europe's economic decline exacerbated by our sanctions and conflicts involving Russia and China demands a reassessment. To answer your questions, yes, yes, and yes. And yes, if I were an Israeli leader, I might find this situation rather confusing, given the circumstances.